that's the beauty of working with families is we're also passionate and also driven to still make like you know a difference in the organic industry and and what we do and and yeah it was pretty cool like you know moving forward who knows what the future will eventually be but um, i'm loving doing what we do now this is the deep in the weeds podcast i'm anthony huckstep A move to more sustainable living and organic food may seem like a recent adoption for many in the hospitality space en masse, but there are some that have built their whole careers immersed in that world. Simon Lawson is the owner and chef of Agape Organic Food Trucks. Simon, how are you? Uh, I'm good, mate. Thanks. Yourself? I'm good. It's good to good to get you on the show. You've uh, been a bit of a crusader for organic food in Australia for a long time now. How, how are things going? Uh, really well. I think that space is really amazing at the moment. Um, uh, people are really responsive to it. And I, I think really like, you know, the gnarly carrots and twisted like uh, different shaped pumpkins and all the other stuff that, that, that doesn't happen anymore. And the produce... Organic produce is just incredible at the moment. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing. Um, you have three different food trucks at the moment, but uh, what what are you doing? Uh, so yeah, so we've got three trucks. Um, man, it's pretty busy. We're basically basically major events like big events and uh, corporate catering. But um, one week just rolls in after the other. And it's, uh, if you ask me this week what I did last week, I really have to think about it because we're working like, you know, a month ahead already or two months ahead. And, yeah, so the calendar fills up pretty quick. And, um, yeah, it's <laughs> – Are the food trucks different in regards to what the offering is? Uh, so the Agape ones are basically the same. The, the menu but look I, I change the menu every now and then and put different things on with seasonality and um, and then we also have like a, a Granny Ivy food truck which is like an Asian kind of inspired one which is uh, inspired by my late grandmother who was Chinese uh, stuff she liked to cook and eat herself and yeah flavors she liked too so but that that one doesn't go out all the time basically the agape ones are just pretty busy pretty pretty much all the time so you, you used to have uh, the restaurant uh, agape uh, but you closed that and concentrated on food trucks well, why did you make that move into food trucks and and let go of the bricks and mortar um i think it was just progression really like uh i guess it's the other way around where people usually start with a food truck and then open a bricks and mortar so i kind of we kind of did it the other way but uh i think the restaurant was there for seven years um we we ran the trucks at the same time for for like five years of those seven and or or four years of those seven it just it the trucks just got busier and busier and um it's been a family affair so my sisters were working there but they both got married and had kids and and then yeah it just it just happened food trucks were just where i busier periods were and where I think we wanted to go as a family. It's, um, yeah, restaurants are hard work, mate. You would know that. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah. um, has, it, has it been beneficial in regards to messaging and spreading the word on organic and um, making people understand it a bit better over the years with the food truck as opposed to somewhere stand still? Oh, I think so, definitely. I mean, look, the beginning of the restaurant and all the way through, we got so much publicity because we were doing something so different. And uh, But then the trucks came and all the – more the media basically shifted to the trucks because it was something new and something Sydney had never seen. So, And I think, you know, just the fact that we're just in different places all the time, like this this week where it's jam-packed, where there's just so many different locations we're at. It's so, you know, I guess – the exposure you're going to get to different people is huge. Is it, is it something that you that you push or people ask about with the food trucks or are you just delivering delicious food and people just get into it? I think that's just come with the progression of the restaurant where where people asked so many questions and sometimes it was it was a bit full on because they'd come in with lists of stuff and say, I've got these diet requirements and can you make something? And I say, well, it's Saturday night and we're jam-packed full, but I don't, why didn't you email me before? But I mean, yeah, you, a lot of people are surprised that uh, 
I mean, there's no other food truck in in Australia that does what we do with with organic produce and the and the suppliers and the farmers and producers that we work with and yeah it, I guess I mean that's just amazing thing and and I probably take it for granted sometimes but it's pretty cool that we get to deliver that wonderful organic produce to you know I guess street food to people that just wouldn't expect it so how much how much has the organic move movement sort of shifted for you you've been part of it all of your career um but sort of if you think back you know a couple of decades ago to now how much has it changed from sort of the soil to the consumer oh wow it was pretty small back in the beginning even though everyone said like the growth rates were were really high like you know the people were more interested in it but i mean now it, it's so much more accepted i guess i mean you still get people that it's like uh you know, it, it, subconsciously in their head, they're already thinking, they still think organic is expensive, but I'm just like, well, my prices are the same as the other trucks because I work hard to do that. But um, yeah, but look, I think it's I think it's more accepted. It's more available. Like you can even just see the restaurants that that are using organic produce, even though they don't put it on the menu, they're, they're just using it because it just, the produce just speaks for itself. It's just better. Well, I want to explore the world of organics and what you're doing there in detail, but take us back to when you were young. Where, where did you grow up and what sort of role did food play? Uh, so I'm uh, mixed like race of Eurasian. My mum's Chinese, Indonesian, and my dad was English, Scandinavian. So just that in itself was pretty cool growing up. Uh, my Chinese grandmother kind of lived with us off and on. She'd, she'd come back and forth from Indonesia. And so she basically ran the kitchen at, at home. And, uh, oh, man, we ate like kings. It was just incredible. It, was, it really was incredible, like uh, just the food. And, and, and I guess growing up in, in Australia as well, you're exposed to so many different cuisines and cultures that, you know, you, you know your taste buds just, I mean, they explode. So that was one of the best things growing up. When did you first start sort of getting interested in food and think about it as a career? Uh, we're kind of a bit of a food obsessed family, <laughs> and, and even even Dad from his side, like Dad was a Dad was a pretty awesome awesome cook too. So I don't know, we everything just kind of revolved around food, pretty much. We we used to grow our own veggies in the front garden, and and we grew up in like uh, in Taramara like Warrawees. So people would look at the bamboo poles in the front garden and think, what, what's going on here? <laughs> I think, I think mum and dad probably watched the, the TV show Good Life too many times. <laughs> but uh, we grew everything. So it was pretty cool, like uh, growing up that way. And, and uh, look, I, I think just progress from there. I, I, I went to Sydney High as for high school and uh, I remember talking to the careers advisor and, and they and I said, I'm thinking about going and working in kitchens, becoming a chef. And, and they were like, wow, Sydney High boys don't do that. They're, they're doctors or lawyers or accountants. Or, uh, and the list went on and they were so shocked. He, he actually rang my mum and and my mum just basically said, you're an idiot. They, he can do whatever he wants. What are you talking about? Like, you know, so it, I don't know. I was going to leave school in year 10 and and think about going into do a pastry apprenticeship. But I remember my dad said he came to me with the, to the interview and he, and he said, no, this guy just wants you to – he was excited when he heard you played rugby. He just wants you to lift stuff. And he said, don't, don't do it. So I was like, yeah, cool. But I, I ended up in kitchens probably uh, three days after I finished my HSC. But, yeah. Well, take us back to that time. What, what were the sort of really important kitchens and people that you worked with as you sort of built your career? Uh, so the first kitchen I worked worked in was Maryvale's on McClay. So the Hemis family owned that. And it, it closed after a few months, but it was a transition where Luke, Mangan was coming in and opening Hotel CBD and I think he, he wanted me to come and work there but he wanted me to wash dishes for six months and yeah, and Murray was the chef at Maryvale's and he said look, I, that's not a good idea just go, I'll get you another job so 
uh, I landed in uh, Bondi, the place called Avalon at Bondi, and Brady was the head chef, and he, I went to it like a like a duck to water. We made everything there. Um, he was classically trained and worked at uh, – he did his apprenticeship at Fanny's in Melbourne back in the day. So, yeah, it, it was eye-opening. We made everything. All the sauces were reduced to order and no one does that. I've never seen anyone do that since too. So it was pretty incredible making Beurre Blancs to, to order and everything. So it was pretty amazing. What was it like for you having grown up in this sort of food-rich family that grew their own vegetables and cooked their own food? Was the commercial kitchen different to what you had experienced growing up? No, oh, it was still daunting, of course. Like you're given boxes of of uh, oysters to shuck and uh, boxes of prawns to peel. And you're like, man, this is like 20-something kilos, 40 kilos, there's two boxes. What are you thinking? It, it's totally – you're totally unprepared no matter what background. And, I mean, mum and dad all had – had like uh, food businesses beforehand and we'd, I'd worked in them and stuff, but this was on a different level. This is, you know, you know poaching eggs in gastronome trays and for breakfast and, you know, it's just the whole lot. So it was, it was cool. I loved it. I, I, I thought it was the best thing ever. And I guess back then when you're an apprentice, like most, most apprentices, you, you just want to be the best chef you can be. And, uh, you know, back in the 90s, we followed all the, you know, all the British chefs and, and Marco Pierre White was was a god, and <laughs> all the French guys. And then Gordon Ramsay came on. We thought, wow, like you know, we'd have the old uh, videotapes of his his uh, crazy shows where <laughs> where you'd probably never want to replicate it. But yeah, it was it was pretty awesome back back in those days. You mentioned that your family operated food businesses in the organic industries. Tell us a little bit, and you worked with them as well. Tell us a bit about that. We had a few kios- I had a kiosk down at Balmoral, basically, uh, on the beach. And um, it wasn't necessarily organic back then, but um, it was a pretty amazing place to work when on the weekends when we were kids. And that, that ran for ages. And um, we had a few other businesses, food businesses before that. And, um, and then, and then mum, mum opened, like, mum started a, uh, food manufacturing business basically making all organic soups and meals and salads and everything and, and they were supplying macro whole foods when they were open and so i left this is a bit further down the track but i left uh, the job that i was working at and um came and worked there which was just the biggest eye opener because you're making like 120 kilo brat pans and kettles full of full of stuff which is totally different to like you know chopping a few gastronome trays of of things for in a restaurant but uh it was it was amazing experience and we we did that for a few years and expanded it and yeah before you sort of uh, went out on your own as a family and opened agape organic restaurant what what was the sort of key venues that you worked at that as you built your career uh so uh, after avalon Bondi. I kind of left there after a year or so, but uh, I went to work at Watermark. <laughs> that was in in Balmoral. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Kenneth, the chef, knew mum and dad, and just kept on and knew me, and just kept on asking me to come work there. And then eventually, it just kind of broke. So I went to work there for a little bit, and that was pretty cool. All the Hong Kong chefs, and they were trying to get me get me to go to Hong Kong. And uh, I think I was like a third year apprentice. They wanted me to go to Hong Kong and uh, work in work in the big hotels there and they said yeah, yeah, yeah we'll get you a chef to party job no worries and when you're an apprentice you're thinking man that's crazy but uh i probably should have done stuff like that and just not thought too much and just did it but anyway uh after watermark i, I went to work at the dolphin hotel uh, i hooked up with with brady which is a chef at avalon that i worked before and uh that was that was huge back in those days the late the late 90s it was a massive it's still a massive venue but it was huge we would we we would do like you know 200 300 covers for per service it was and we'd have functions and all all a lot too it was it was busy it was different to smaller places i worked at so yeah it was pretty cool tell us about the inception of uh agape organic restaurant and and how that came about 
Uh, I think I've always wanted to open my own restaurant. That's what my sisters keep telling me. <laughs> I tell them. I can't remember specifically saying that I did. But, yeah, no, I guess that's that was always probably one of the dreams. And uh, and I was working at Nove down at uh, Woolloomooloo, like next, next to Otto. And and it's the first time I'd made pizzas and stuff. And, uh, look, I, I don't know, we, we talked a lot about, like, you know, I guess the whole family is immersed in organic industry then and uh, – you know, we 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 had so many different su- suppliers that were like f- that have become really close friends over the years. They're like family, and yeah, I was working in the family business, doing the food manufacturing, and then we, I guess, I, I, it, I miss doing service and doing bulk bulk prep like that was never really my kind of thing, but you know, it was a great learning curve. But uh, yeah. I, I, we decided to do that, and we looked for ages for for a place. And I don't know why, but uh, when we when when we did look at botany, and we were still doing some food manufacturing, we needed a place big enough to be able to do some of that too in catering jobs. And uh, I don't know what it was, but just botany just kind of fit with all the family, and that was it. So it uh, came about that way, I guess. <laughs> yeah. What were the challenges in sort of setting that up and um, particularly with an organic agenda at that time, you know, uh, take us back to that time. Yeah, that was massive. That was, and it was 2009 and uh, that was when we'd had that big, like, you know, global kind of financial crisis and I, I don't know. I mean, there were lots of challenges, uh, lots of challenges with the lease, lots of challenges with opening the place. Uh, we, 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 we moved in and then we moved out and then we basically had to renegotiate and move back in again and it, it was it was pretty crazy at the time and, and I thought and I was a bit upset I thought look I, you know I don't know if I want to keep on doing this the food manufacturing and my heart was really set on opening the restaurant at that stage but I'd never opened a restaurant before it's uh, it's a massive undertaking it's huge. Even the, I mean, look, we did mo- a lot of the renovations ourselves. We had friends come in. We had so many people come and help and, and that were excited about it. Uh, uh, when I look back now, it was a really special time um, that, uh, you know, cause, and, and, and we were groundbreaking. It was doing something that no one had really ever done before. And I guess people were just so, and they were so excited and, and anticipating what we would what we were going to do. So it's looking back, I'm, I'm really proud of what we achieved as, as a family and what, what we actually did and that the restaurant ran for so long and, you know, where, where people were always like, why botany and why this? And, but look, people would travel from everywhere and, and come there, which was, which is pretty amazing. And, and yeah, something we, we're still really proud of. I mean, we still get people coming up to the trucks and, and saying, Oh, I ate at your restaurant. Are you ever going to open one again? And I'm like, oh, mate, I don't think so. <laughs> I used to say, oh, yeah, maybe, but I think the last couple of years I've just been like, there's no, no thanks. <laughs> Agape really was groundbreaking for its time and uh, you received many accolades, you know, being in the top 10 pizzas in Sydney and sustainable restaurant and all sorts of things. Um, what was it like for you sort of, you know, being part of that sort of movement, um, what sort of impact did it have on you? On me personally, I thought it was the best thing ever. Like, you know, that's that's what we we never would expect, like, you know, that we would get all this, like, uh, media attention. We, we didn't start out like that. We did, I think we just started out with this message that we wanted to make, break down the barriers that organic was not this, like, elitist and expensive uh, produce and brown rice and lentils kind of stuff. And uh, I just cooked food that I probably always used to cook and and uh, got excited about, about the produce and talking to the farmers and uh, I don't know it was it was a pretty it was a, it was an amazingly special time and and to get those like top 10 pizzas I'm just like man oh man like you know look at these other guys they've been you know cooking pizzas for years and and then uh, I remember <laughs> I remember, and just yeah, one after the other, all the reviewers would come in, and yeah, it was it was pretty cool. I, I loved it, and you know, it it was. I guess it's it was changing that perception of what organic food can be, and 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 maybe hopefully it made other people think, oh wow, we can do this too, and yeah, so it was pretty amazing. 
you briefly mentioned the farmers and getting to know them during that period of time. Do you have any stories of the connections you made with organic farmers uh, through the through your career? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I, we uh, Greg is a good mate from Block Eleven. He, um, <laughs> we, we, we kind of discovered him at the markets, but uh, I don't know. Over the years, look, we use I don't know if you know Gundui Organics. Rob Lennon is like this uh, rock star farmer. <laughs> <laughs> the beef industry. He looks like a mad scientist, and and we're good mates. Like so, so, we used to get a carcass every month from him at the restaurant and break break it all down. We still got we, we've got one downstairs actually in the in the cool room that we broke down yesterday. So that's always a big job. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, over the year we've oh, all different places. And right now we're getting our spelt flour from Whispering Pines, and and they're amazing, an amazing family that. That's growing all different types of wheat varieties, and ah, um, oh, there's so many, there's so many people over the years, I guess, that that we've worked with, and um, back in the day, I, I, I guess most of the fruit and veg came from Echo Farms and and um, organic ODP, organic direct produce and stuff, and they're distributors. But then, you know, we still we still kept contact with farmers and that's gotten easier as the years have gotten on to, to buy direct from them where it wasn't as easier in the beginning it was all through distributors or the fruit and veg mainly um, and then over the years I guess we've, we've gone direct to farmers and uh, different pig farmers over the years and they've come and gone and and then uh, lamb from yeah AOM Australian Organic Meats they're O'Leary family they're really good people I don't know. It was just, yeah, those connections and it's pretty cool. Like, you know, I'll pick up the phone and just ring and we'll have a chat. And uh, and then all of a sudden, you know, Greg will say, oh, the tractor's running. I've got to run off or or Rob will be driving like the trucks to the to the uh, abattoir and he'll say, oh, it's going to cut out soon. We, and then it does and, you know, we'll just pick it up later on. And oh, I don't know. It's all, all, different, all different stuff over the years like that and, I don't know. We've just become really good friends and it's like family, basically. Tell us about your cooking in that period of time with the restaurants. Was, is there a dish or two from that period of time that really stands out that sort of exemplified what you were doing? I really loved the spelt pizzas that we did. Um, they were so different to, I guess, what everyone else had, had probably seen. And I mean, I guess I, 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 I played around with flavours a lot and I don't think, I mean, people still ask me about them am I going to do them again and we, we got the chance during the lockdowns to kind of open up like a pop-up thing and we did the pizzas for a while but uh yeah they were pretty special I think no one had done done pizzas like that and um and then I guess just the different produce like uh it, it, when we started working with Rob from Gundui it's just great it was his beef is just incredible like uh and you know getting the whole carcass you'd have to think of how to use it all up uh, that was the mo- most amazing learning curve and cooking wise for me is is <laughs> cutting up a whole beef like I never thought when you're an apprentice you never think kind of that stuff like you know oh yeah we'll do this like you know you just you in the 90s you, you just buy everything in it was in cryvac you know and you just portion it but uh you know thinking what the, what the heck am I going to do with this top side it's just not that forgiving <laughs> but uh yeah no we're working those out and 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 then, you know, I mean, pigs and lambs, they're pretty easy to cut up. They're, the beef is just enormous. So working out all the pieces, it's pretty cool, that 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 kind of cooking that way. And really the produce kind of, you know, back in those days, it, it was really super seasonal, like, you know, and it is now to some extent too, but you can get produce from Victoria and Queensland at different times of the year and, you know, WA sometimes. So we try and stay as local as possible and, Local in, in Australia and New South Wales is, of course, it's not the same as, you know, Europe and stuff because we have to travel so much distance to get to our farmlands. But, uh, yeah, I think seasonality, that was kind of a big learning curve when we first started cooking. Uh, you know, you can't just order, oh, yeah, basil doesn't grow in winter. Figure something out or grow yourself. <laughs> but the pizza needs basil. Anyway, yeah, so we, we grew stuff ourselves as well to kind of fill in the gaps. You not only had the challenge of running bricks and mortar, but also um, sharing the knowledge of organic food, but you also um, were working with your family. What, what was it like working with family members? Uh, yes, yeah, 
I mean, we're a pretty tight family. It's pretty cool. Uh, um, I don't know if most people work with families. You have challenges. But uh, the most rewarding thing is, I think, is they're always going to have your back like 110 percent or more like you know they they will always be there for you like you know and that's really special with with especially mum like you know she's always supported what all her kids want to do um whatever it was she would just not ask any questions she would just get in there and and help and do anything she can to make sure we're a success and that I guess you know that permeates through all of us now it's it's pretty cool and we're still Pretty much, fa- like after after all the lockdowns, pretty much fa- uh, family business now. Like you know, still like run and run and uh, operated. So you know, everyone pitches in. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've been such a groundbreaker in regards to organic food in Australia, and um, but you've also been dealing with an autoimmune condition. Tell us, tell us, a, tell us a little bit about that and the impact it's had. So in uh, when was it? about two thousand six, I, I was uh, I got pneumonia kind of really badly, and I probably wasn't looking after myself uh, uh, properly working in restaurants and stuff like you know the lifestyle is pretty yeah pretty mad, and I probably liked it a little too much, <laughs> and uh, I got really sick and I got pneumonia and I've and I've had pneumonia once before when I was a kid. And uh, with, with this ankylosing spondylitis is the, is the condition I have. Um, you have a gene marker, but uh, most, of the, most of the time it remains dormant. And then uh, you need like a big kind of trauma or illness or something to, to really onset it and bring it on, like most autoimmune diseases. But um, I, was still, I was still working, I was working in Nova at the time and I remember I got really sick and, and uh, yeah. then I... Uh, so look, but our GP, our doctor, didn't want to put me in hospital. He said, "Look, you, you really, I was really not in a good way." And if pneumonia is the kind of thing where I don't know, you, you just can't do anything. You can't really breathe very well. You can't move. You just feel just you're just gone, like you know. And and he didn't want to put me in hospital because he said, "Look, it's it's not it's your immune levels are your yeah you know, so low that it's it's dangerous there." So he treated me at home and. And mum looked after me and, and everything. And, and I, me- I remember I got better and then went back to work and there was something wrong with my back. It just wasn't right. And and I always thought over the years that it was like a, you know, oh, one of the perks of working in kitchens But because, uh, you know, everyone has back problems every now and then. But but uh, I saw physio and then uh, that just that was even worse. Then uh, I went to see my osteo that I'd seen before for a while and and he was like, after a while, he was like, look, this is not working. We're going to do more tests. And then we did tests and then that was diagnosed. And and then back then, like uh, when I first got diagnosed, I had like uh, extreme like osteoporosis as well, which which is now since then it's gone, disappeared, So which is amazing. That doesn't really happen. But um, yeah, it was tough. It was hard. Like, you know, I, I don't know. I probably didn't look after myself the best when I first got diagnosed. I just kept on doing the same things and thought, okay, look, you know, I changed my diet a little bit. But it was like most diets, a yo-yo. And, uh, and the, the, the condition attacks the – it's an inflammatory condition. It attacks the major joints in, in your body. And so I'm in, I'm in <laughs> acute chronic pain most of the time, like uh, – so it's tough. I, I, look, I don't know many people that would run businesses with this condition. Most people are on, like you know, bed rest and stuff. But it, it's kind of like, it's kind of a, I don't know. It's a blessing and a curse that the work that I do because with my condition, you need to be really mobile all the time because otherwise the joints will just stiffen up too much, and then you just you know, to get them loose again and going is, yeah, it's it's rough sometimes. You know, it's, uh, you know, walking sticks and not being able to walk properly in the bad moments. And uh, then you've got the the things of if you spend too much time resting, then the joints stiffen more. So the recovery after that is can be intense. But um, I, I'm pretty positive kind of person. I don't kind of look at that. And I think, I think there's, you know, there's a lot more people worse off that with more life-threatening illnesses. But it does affect... 
you know, what I do. And I don't think I, for that reason, I don't think I could ever cook, cook in a restaurant again because it's so physical and, you know, over the years it's degenerative, my condition. So I've got uh, a kyphosis where your spine kind of, you're like a hunchback basically, where it kind of comes forward. But look, I, I saw different specialists over the years and everything else and they just wanted me to go down on the conventional path and being our family, what we're like, we were just like, no, 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 well, you know, you've, you've told me if I take this drug, I might lose all my jawbone and uh, different things and uh, you can't take it for more than six months because it's too dangerous and uh, could bring on other things. And I'm just like, okay, well, wow, okay. Look, we'll try and do it as natural as possible and um, that's what we've done over the years. And, yeah, we've we've had – I've seen, like, you know, good results and bad results and, you know, realistically to kind of reset the whole thing, I would probably have to take like a whole year off and work on that all the time. But uh, look, yeah, it's, it's what it is. I mean, I deal with it and my family is the biggest help and, you know, having my own business, I get to kind of adjust my work routines and my, yeah, you know, you, yeah, I guess that's the best thing. And then with the food trucks too, you know, you're not stuck to service you know, there's weeks where you really eat a lot busier than other weeks. So you're not stuck to that service where you've got to be open all the time and, you know, you can kind of manage it a little bit better. But it does suck. It's, you know, it's not the greatest thing to to have. What's been the benefits in the food truck sense for what you do and um, the condition that you have? Like how have you managed to sort of get the two aligned? Uh, well, I, I, like I said, you don't, so you're not stuck in that, like, you know, oh, service, you've got to be open Tuesday. Oh, you've got to probably start, get there at, like, whatever time in the morning. I mean, we still we still make everything ourselves with the trucks. Like, you know, we're, we're, everything is prepped and, and a lot of it by me, like, you know. So that's a good thing. But uh, I, I guess it's the time management. And it's having your own business too and not being locked into that service where you have to be open every day at that certain time because – you know, we can have. We're always doing stuff like you do when you're own, when you own your own business. But uh, there's there's times where you don't have to have that service, and and services can be rough. It's still on the trucks too. It's full on. Like uh, it's it's crazy. Like so, some of the time, the lines, the li- most of the time, the lines are just mad, and you've got to be quick. You got to serve and in, in like you know seconds, and and whereas restaurants, you you've got a lot more time. But most, I don't know, most restaurant chefs would say that, but it's very, very different. The service is very different for a food truck, particularly for a chef. It's more consumer facing. Does does that have a positive impact on you having that real sort of tangible connection with the people eating your food? Uh, that's probably the best thing. And I, I've spoken to a few people that, I mean, look, can be pretty down going into the same kitchen every day like uh, and so those four walls but we, we get to go to different locations different events different like you know i've listened to more live music over the last 12 years that i probably did my life it's been amazing like it's really cool you get front row seats to uh, some of the best concerts and music festivals in in australia it's uh that that is the most exciting thing and then also i get to talk to people too like you know we get so many people coming back to the truck and i, I don't know if that happens to other trucks but they come back and say thank you so much that was so incredible like you know i can't believe like you know it's so different to what anyone else does and, yeah, that the organic produce you're using and everything. They, I, I don't know. We get multiple people all the time coming back, happy customers. So. Tell, tell us a little bit about the food that you're cooking in the trucks. Is there is there a dish or two that's on sort of high rotation that you can tell us about? Uh, so probably the, the top three kind of dishes, the biggest sellers are, so our pulled Wagyu beef rice bowl. And that's with rice, quinoa, uh, beet, slaw, homemade pickles, miso barbecue sauce, chimichurri, and and crispy onions. It's it's pretty tasty. Uh, fish tacos are, are a big big winner. There with so we use purple corn tacos, and uh, then it's got the spelt battered fish which is – and then jalapeno jam, which we make ourselves, and mayo and slaw and stuff. It, 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 that's really a winner that we get so many people coming back and saying they want those. 
So those are the two main things. But there's a whole, whole lot. We do nachos and poutine is really popular. We use real cheese curds that we have to import from North America. And, uh, yeah, I mean, look, we make everything ourselves from the beef stock to reduce it down to make gravy for those kind of dishes and all the sauces and everything. Uh, we're, the only things we don't make are the spelt buns that we get and um, – yeah, that's pretty much it, basically. Everything else is in-house, which is unheard of. Like, you know, a lot of other food trucks won't do that. They'll, you know, they're buying produce in and or st- yeah, stuff in and yeah. Well, you've had one of the largest impacts on organic food and the perception of it in Australia over your career. Um, do you have any sort of plans coming up beyond the three food trucks? Uh, they've probably changed since, since all those lockdowns kind of happened. They probably like you know i guess before that we're always wanting to build build more i mean we you know we've always had different ideas of what trucks we want to do and there's 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 an old vintage ice cream truck downstairs (laughs) it's parked there it's been there for ages (laughs) it's probably a project for another lifetime but uh yeah but that kind of reset and a little bit like you know uh, after all those lockdowns and everything else where it was tough like you know the event industry was probably one of the ones that was kind of forgotten a little bit like, you know, everyone was saying, you know, restaurants were getting heaps of help and, and they could change and go to, you know, um, you know, take take out and everything else like that. But basically we're in we're in Melbourne, the Grand Prix, and uh we had, we had so two trucks down there and everything else and and then they closed it down. And we was like, what are we going to do now? So uh, that kind of changed a lot of things and family growing up and stuff. And I think we kind of, we kind of went a bit more, insular and said look okay we're just going to do a lot of things ourselves and uh you know we'll ask for favors when we can and yeah maybe moving forward look we've always wanted to buy like a property and uh grow stuff ourselves and 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 uh probably grow stuff and uh, produce food to you know different things to sell kind of stuff like uh yeah but look that's that's always we're always looking uh, I don't know if you can find the perfect property, but we're always looking. So that's that's probably one of the things moving forward, and and probably as I get older, and and probably thinking about quality of life more. And as as my two my niece and nephew are growing up, and you probably want to think, look, we really wanted to do that when we were kids, and we probably should have done that. And I don't know why, mum and dad probably we always thought we would do that, and we just it never came about. But I think in the future, that's probably one thing we really. That's probably our main focus now is to to do that and build that and eventually transition. Maybe who knows? I've, look, I'm I'm the kind of person that just will take it take it as it is. I, I don't want to write like a five year plan because they can always change and you got to be adaptable and and not have anything so set in stone. But it's good to have plans, like you know, otherwise you can get lost along the way. But that's definitely one of the things we we would love to do. Well, you continue to um, push the envelope for organic produce and, and food in Australia. What do you love about what you do? Uh, I guess it's, it's, it's exciting. I still love cooking and still love food. And and I, and I, I think some people <laughs> probably think you're crazy that it's a bit of a chore sometimes. But I, I love picking up the phone and speaking to the, the farmers and, and stuff like that. And, and they're like, oh, wow, I've got this new this new tomato or this new like uh, type of pumpkin or cauliflower or, or you know, whatever it is. I mean, we'll have these conversations with mum. She always wants me to, oh, look, I looked this up. Let's do this. This is amazing. That's, and mum's really passionate. Like she, she won't stop. And I'm just like, mum, you should have had more kids. Like, you know, <laughs> It's it's impossible for me to do everything, but look, I mean that's the that's the beauty of working with families is we're also passionate and also driven to still make like you know a difference in the organic industry and and what we do and and yeah, it was pretty cool. Like you know, moving forward, who knows what the future will eventually be? But um, I'm loving doing what we do now and being able to work so closely with family and. It's really rewarding, that is. Yeah. Well, Simon, um, it's amazing to have you on Deep in the Weeds today to hear just a part of your story. Um, please keep in touch and we'll have to catch up again soon. Yeah, awesome. We'll do it. Thank you. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. 
Stay tuned as we take a deep dive into the lives of the incredible people who ply their trade in the food and hospitality sector. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds Podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.